Well, good evening and a very warm welcome on behalf of Milim to this evening's presentation. Welcome wherever you are in the UK and indeed wherever you are in the world. And once again, I'd like to welcome our viewers in Canada, in Ireland, in Israel and across the pond in the United States of America. Our series of online talks and conversations continues with our guest Raymond Gabe and uh, CBE. And I'll introduce Raymond in just a moment. You're welcome to ask questions. Please do this by typing whatever it is you'd like to ask into the Q&A facility on your screen. And as ever, we'll try to get through as many of your questions <coughs> as possible. Can I also draw your attention to the chat facility? This can be used to send a message to all of the other participants on this webinar, should you wish to do so. Finally, this event is being recorded and will appear on the Millim website at millim.org.uk in the next few days. There you can find recordings of past events, as well as details of our future programme uh, for which you can book tickets. And so to our guest this evening, Raymond Gabe was born in Cricklewood, raised in Golders Green and educated in Hampstead. Initially articled to his father, a chartered accountant, he found his way to working in music and concerts, setting out on his own age 20. He built a name and a brand for popular music concerts, opera and ballet, working with performers such as Yehudi Menuhin, Luciano Pavarotti and the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, as well as Ray Charles, Miles Davis and Andrew Lloyd Webber. His colourful journey is told in his recent memoir, Lowering the Tone and Raising the Roof, which is highly recommended. Raymond, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We're really delighted to have you uh, as our guest. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, and, and thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm excited to be here. I can't see anyone apart from you, but I know everyone's out there, so good evening, and um, a lovely opportunity to be with you all. Well, you've got a, you've got a great audience uh, tonight, um, and hopefully uh, we're all going to enjoy uh, hearing uh, some of your, uh, your, your, your stories. So let, let's start with the book. What, what made you want to write this book? Well, um, I'd, I'd been thinking about it for a long time, and uh, my my friend uh, Craig Hassel, who runs the Royal Albert Hall, when I when I sold up the business, he said you should you should write it all down. And so um, he persuaded me because this year is the Hall's 150th anniversary. He said you should do it in time for the Hall's anniversary because we're going to give you a concert, which they were going to do in May, um, celebrating my. Uh, long, you know, five, five, five plus decades working with them as part of their celebrations. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, that's been postponed until next May because of the, uh, the COVID, but I carried on with the book um, and um, delighted to do so, uh, brought back a lot of old memories, um, a lot of things I wanted to write down, things I can uh, pass on to my children and my grandchildren um, and have something recorded. That, that was really what it is. It, it's, an, it's an honest account of, uh, of my life and, uh, and what I've, what I've uh, been through. And somebody said to me, well, or more than one person, well, I'd love to see the unexpurgated edition. But I said, you know, that what you have here is that's it. If you want to see um, anything more, you know, there is a subtext on occasion, which you can uh, very clearly see. But I, I never went out of my way to, uh, Want to put the knife in for anyone? I just wanted to tell things as I saw them, and it was a lovely opportunity to do so. Now, you you start by saying um, there were three questions that changed your life. So, yes. so what were the three questions, and how well, did they change your life? Well, I I, I went uh, for an interview to for Victor Hockhauser, who was a very uh, preeminent promoter producer concerts at the Royal Albert Hall and uh, Russian ballet soloists and so on. And I got an introduction to him quite by chance through Arnold Wesker, um, the, the playwright, a complicated thing. But anyway, I got the number 28 bus from Golders Green to Kensington Church Street, where he had his office above the fridge shop. And um, I went in there and uh, there were three questions. And he said, um, uh, where did you go to school? Uh, are you a Jewish boy? Um, can you start on Monday? And that was the interview. And that was it. I was launched. And I, I did. I started the following mon Monday. It was just fortuitous. And I stayed there for 10 months, 28 days and 12 hours, as I always like to say, as a sort of um, a course in, in advance to uh, promoting and producing and, you know, an opportunity to learn everything. It was fantastic. I loved it. 
So let's backpedal a little bit before um, you joined uh, Hochhauser um, in, in his business. T tell us something about growing up in these different parts of London I, I mentioned when, when I introduced you and, and some, something of your, your, your background and childhood. Sure. Well, um, I was um, born uh, after the war, the, the, the uh, 1946, uh, the war had been over for a year. Uh, born in Cricklewood, brought up in Golders Green, um, and uh, I had a very happy childhood there. There was always music in the house. My mother played the piano very well. My father played the violin. Uh, my brother also played the, played the violin. I failed grade one piano, but there we are. I was destined for other things, but clearly while all this music was going on um, and I was playing with my friends and with my toys and goodness knows what else, some of it was washing uh, over me. And, um, and then we were very lucky in Golders Green because we had the Golders Green Hippodrome, which was a theatre, a lovely theatre, uh, which was the, for, for many shows coming into London in the days before there were previews, it was the last stop. Um, before they opened in the West End. So there was an opportunity to see great um, shows of different sorts. Uh, and, and starting with when I was young with the pantomime, uh, and then my, my grandmother, God, God rest her, you know, she took me up to the gods right at the top on wooden benches. It was half a crown in old money for adults and a bit less for children. And uh, she, she would go on Saturday matinees. And I can't remember what I saw, but she loved musicals and operetta and goodness knows what. So we went and saw a lot of these and we saw the, the Doily Cart Opera Company quite regularly. And there was sometimes ballet, very occasionally opera. It was a tr tremendous sort of um, uh, introduction to all kinds of different types of entertainment. Now, you didn't stay with Victor Hochhauser very long. What, what was it that made you want to start up on your own? And how did you achieve that at, at such a young age? Well, I think, uh, you know, when you're young, you've got youthful arrogance and you think you can do it all. And I saw, I, I mean, I had an opportunity. There was an opportunity because it was the time of Jenny Lee, the, the first time we'd had a, a, a Minister of Culture or Minister for the Arts in Harold Wilson's government. And, and there'd never been a, an appointment like that before. And she encouraged the local authorities to spend what was called in old money, the sixpenny rent is two and a half P, that they could, they, could, they could spend that on entertainment, the arts, culture, whatever. So there's quite a lot of money over the country and quite a lot of them started building little theatres and halls and so on. And I had uh, three or four singers and a pianist going around with my Gilbert and Sullivan evenings and Viennese evenings and so on. And, and, and they were, that was absolutely ideal for these places. It all started off actually in the northeast, um, a bit north of where, 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 where you are, um, when the Northeast Arts Association uh, was formed uh, based on Newcastle and serving that whole area around there. And uh, I, for some reason, I got to know the deputy director, a guy called Neil Duncan, and he said, can you do a Gilbert and Sullivan evening for us? And they had all these associated member societies who met once a year to plan their programmes and coordinate them. And apparently they wanted a, a Gilbert and Sullivan evening, but the only one on the market was too expensive. So I came in at uh, 80 guineas a night, uh, on which I could make some money. I don't know how, but I did. And uh, I got um, uh, um, uh, some, uh, a good headline artist, John Cameron, who was a baritone, who was quite well known in the opera world, uh, and three other singers with him and a pianist. And we did this Gilbert and Sullivan evening around the Northeast. I think they gave us eight or 10 dates. And that's how the whole thing began. And I thought, oh, you know, I've got the, 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 the beginnings of a business here. It might last me six months. And uh, my mother always hoped I'd get a proper job, but you know, 55 years later, whatever it is, uh, yeah, I've sold up now and I've retired, but uh, you know, it carried on and uh, it grew and grew and, um, and, and, and gave me a wonderful livelihood and, and something I really enjoyed. So how were those early years of your business? Were, were there any disasters? I mean, did, did you ever feel like giving up? Um, not in those days, I didn't feel like giving up. I mean, later on, my accountant, uh, Told me, I, told me I ought to uh, uh, fold the company because I couldn't carry on. But I think every producer and promoter at some time in their life has probably had news of that kind. And uh, I just put my head, on, head down and, and carried on and got through it. But in the early days, no, the excitement was going out and being my own boss, you know, at 20. Uh, and goodness knows how I had these artists, uh, you know, working for me. I suppose I was paying them money. So they, <laughs> they said, oh, what, what, what the heck, you know, let's do this. And uh, so um, I had this, um, you know, youthful enthusiasm. And it was 
to me, it was much more about being my own boss, creating uh, these the, the productions, and um, uh, the money was secondary to that. The fact that I actually earned my living from it um, was was a sort of bonus. Um, I just loved it, and and it was the way of life that I really enjoyed, and I saw everywhere, everywhere, everywhere around the country. You know, I, I mean, Leeds we'd come to often, Yorkshire, the northeast, uh, uh, Lancashire, and all the these the smaller places, the smaller venues. I, I knew them very well, and uh, it was just very great fun. It was a great pleasure. I think if I look back, and I've done many, many things, and no doubt you'll, you'll ask me questions about them, but when I look back, that was a fantastic time of, of freedom, liberation, being able to do what I wanted. That was really something. But although um, you'd left uh, Victor Hochhauser, and I suppose he wasn't delighted that, that you had, he, he, he later came to ask you, uh, to help him uh, with, with some projects. T tell us something about that. Well, I think that probably the one you're thinking of, but uh, do, do tell me um, if I, um, is when uh, the, he had the, the uh, Georgian um, folk dance company uh, from Georgia, obviously part of the Soviet Union in those days. <clears throat> this is the mid seventies and he was going to do a season at the Coliseum. And there was a lot of uh, um, feeling uh, about the way that the, uh, the, the, the Jewish um, uh, people were being treated in the Soviet Union, the Panoffs and um, Sharansky and oh, all the other names I, I remember. And he, he got uh, frightened and didn't want to, he seemed to be doing the Georgian State Dance Company. So he said, would I put it on? Uh, but he, he didn't want me to put it on under my name. He ma it made me use the name of a little agency I had at the time called Tower Music. Anyway, we, we, we did this, and um, uh, the, the first night at the London Coliseum, it was a near riot with people running on stage and shouting, you know, uh, free, free the Panos and Sharansky and so on. And it, it got quite out of control. The police had to come in, and, um, uh, and he was sort of slinking around the corner somewhere, I remember. But we got through that, and um, uh, by the end of the season, he produced some programs with his name on that he gave to the Russian ambassador very, very secretly so that nobody else would see them. But that, that was the, the, the one time I remember when I, I, I did work with him. I admired him a lot. I mean, I think he, he pioneered, did lots of things that uh, uh, were fantastic. Now, the Barbican played uh, a big part in, in your career. What, what, what can you tell us about, about that place? Well, I, I could tell you a lot about it, actually, but the Barbican opened in, eventually opened in 1982, but it had been on the, uh, on, on the drawing board for 12 or, or more years. Well, the director, Henry Wrong, had been there for 12 years before it eventually opened, and it had been, been planned from the mid-60s, and it kind of, uh, it just grew um, because originally they were going to put in a small theatre and concert hall for the Guildhall School of Music, but then uh, somewhere along the line, they decided that these would both be enlarged so that they could play, become the home of the London Symphony Orchestra and the Royal Shakespeare Company. And I went round the Barbican uh, three years before it eventually opened in 1979. I wrote to Henry Wrong and he said, come over. And we put hard hats on and uh, boots and walked around. And although it wasn't finished, the roof was on, you could see everything. And I thought, this is nothing like this going to happen in my lifetime again. So I made a commitment there and then to book a few dates. And um, the, the, the venue opened eventually in March uh, 1982. And uh, uh, the first night the Queen came and it was a gala occasion. And just before she arrived, there was a terrible tragedy. Um, a man uh, waiting to see her dropped dead in the foyer and a very quick thinking member of the Barbican team gathered together floral uh, um, 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 uh, bouquets and so on that were decorating the foyer and piled them on the corpse. And the Queen walked round and effected not to notice. Uh, that was how the, Barbican, how the Barbican started. But that was uh, the beginning of, a, of an incredible journey because I did my first concerts in April of that year. And uh, I rang up uh, to see how the box office was going. I had three concerts over Easter, over the Easter weekend, and the box office figures were, you were OK, not, not that encouraging. And then two days later, I rang for an update, and suddenly they shot up. And I, I said, can I talk to the box office manager? You know, what's going on here? And he said, oh, no, no, it's absolutely correct. He said, we, we had so much mail, we couldn't open all the mailbags. So it's been taking us time to process everything. And, of course, in those days, there were not, credit cards uh, 
or they were just coming in there. They were by no means universal. So people sent in checks, rang up to uh, to reserve their tickets and so on. And so everything sold out. I found I had to put on extra concerts. And suddenly, um, in the first year, I did 50 concerts from the initial five, and uh, I got 90% attendance. And they opened the diary to me because they they were they were not getting that many book bookings. And in nine in the calendar year 1983, I did 130 concerts, including lunchtime concerts. I think something I I wouldn't want to do again, or they certainly wouldn't want me back to do. But at the time, it was fantastic. It just they were so thrilled, and I was thrilled. And it uh, it was a tremendous experience to be there. And it's going to be 40 years next year since it opened. It's extraordinary. Uh, how time has flown by, but um, I, th I always think with the Barbican, you know, when they talk about they were going to build another hall uh, on the site of the Museum of London for the London Symphony Orchestra uh, as something in addition to the Barbican, and that fell through during the pandemic. And I have to say, I'm not that surprised, I'm not surprised and I'm not sorry. I think the Barbican is a great hall and, you know, we, we can always look for something that's better. We can always say, why don't we have this? Why don't we have that? But we should also be very uh, grateful for what we've got. And um, London is blessed with three concert halls. Um, uh, Birmingham has a wonderful hall. Manchester has a great hall. Uh, Leeds Town Hall, yeah, you know, it, it, it's fine. But, you know, I, I can't remember whether there's a plan to build a, a concert hall in Leeds. I'm sure it will come because it's a city that absolutely uh, deserves it. And all around the country, there are these different uh, venues. But going back to the Barbican, it was really special. And I got a chance to do different sorts of things there. Um, uh, um, uh, different artists brought in people like uh, Victor Borger. I did a masterclass with uh, Pavarotti, uh, Yehudi Menu in, uh, and, and it was just a fantastic roster of, of uh, names. Worked with all the four London orchestras and had a, lot of fun, a great deal of fun. We, uh, we actually have the Leeds Arena now, which I think seats, seats yes. about 15,000. So yes. We, yes. We, ha we have, um, you know, we, we have something of, of scale. Now, now your concerts um, were funded, if I'm right, by selling tickets. Um, yes. You, you weren't given uh, subsidies from Arts no. Council or whoever, like uh, no. many other um uh, venues or promoters uh, were given so I, I wonder how the establishment um reacted to you being successful where where this this is something they they it appears they couldn't do themselves um well i think they they tried to explain it um in many different ways i believe the arts council had meetings and so on the simple fact is that i was going for popular concerts what you know to appeal to um mass audiences and it, it, the whole point about having subsidies, you have subsidy in order to do things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. So, you know, we've got great orchestras, uh, dance companies, opera companies, theater companies, and so on, uh, that need that public support to enable them to keep a permanent company together uh, and, and to do challenging programs and productions. Uh, and I'm not, I have never have argued um, against subsidy. I think it's absolutely right. Uh, whether it always goes to the right place, um, I, I'm not so sure. But listen, in Leeds, you've got wonderful Opera North who uh, do a fantastic job, uh, make full use of the money they've got, provide you with wonderful productions and, and, and are a great uh, um, spotlight on, on Leeds uh, as to what can be achieved. I think it's tremendous and, and all power to their elbow. Now, the, the list of the great and the good who you've worked with is, is a long one. Um, I wonder who stands out and maybe there's a story or two you could you could share with us. Well, I, I, I loved and uh, ironically, I mean, well, not ironically, but the, the, the two that stand out are, are both uh, Jewish ones, Yehudi Menuhin, who was just such a wonderful person. Um, by the time I was working with him, he was no longer a great violinist, but he was a great person um, and, and had an aura. And I went with him to Germany once and he was mobbed um, after a concert in um, uh, Hamburg. Um, uh, the people there loved him. He, he had gone there after the war. I think he was the first artist of, of any note who'd gone there. Uh, to use music as a way to heal, and um, uh, and they never they never f forgotten that. And and I, I I thought it was a great privilege to work with him. I worked with him on many occasions. And, and the other one, of course, was Victor Borger, who I, I absolutely loved. And um, his 
he, his Christian name was Borger, and he adopted the name Victor Borger when he went to America. But he came out on the last boat from Denmark uh, to Sweden. Uh, the Danes, I think, saved all their, their Jewish population, managed to, 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 to move them across to Sweden. And Borger went to uh, America, and it was a serious classical musician, uh, found that he was getting laughs when he sort of did his interjections and so on, and suddenly he developed a whole comedy act from that. And th that was a, a, a tremendous um, pleasure to work with him and to sit down with him and have a meal afterwards, and he'd be, you know, talking seriously about things, and, and uh, that was lovely. Uh, there was one time in the, in the Barbican when uh, Henry Wrong had gone and uh, been replaced by... Detero coin about uh, whom there's been a lot uh, recorded and, and written uh, and she was an odd choice because she'd come from the milk marketing board which is not a natural sort of place you'd associate somebody coming from to run one of the great art centers and uh, I'm afraid she wasn't very good and uh, she said she must come and see Victor Borger and he did the gag where he has a microphone and he pulls it, you know, the assistant uh, who was his son actually comes out with a microphone and he, he pulls it to go to the other side of the, sta the stage and it snags. And he says to the audience, look, you know, uh, uh, millions on this place and then, you know, a few pence more they could have paid for a proper lead. You see, and everybody laughs, it's very funny, except the, the bar Baroness, as she had become by then, Detro Coin, who said she was deeply embarrassed uh, when she saw him, met him afterwards. She said she was deeply embarrassed but she'd make sure it was put right for the following night. And for the only time in my life I've, I ever saw I, that I'd ever seen him absolutely, uh, completely lost for words. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. Well, you, you describe um, more than one person like this who seems to be um, the wrong person for the job. And um, they seem to be promoted, or as in this case, <laughs> ennobled um, as a result of their failure. And... I wondered if you had any view on how some of our cultural institutions are, are managed and run, because this is this is not um, a, a lone instance, is it? It happens quite a lot. Well, I think that uh, in general, the people that actually run the cultural places, opera houses, orchestras, and so on, are deeply committed and 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 uh, want to succeed and and want to make the best of the resources that they've got. The problem is sometimes with the the boards that um, uh, you know, people are on these boards who, what we call the great and the good. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes they sort of leave their brains at the stage door or the, the artist entrance or whatever it is, the sort of um, organization, uh, because they think they can do it better than the professionals that are doing it, rather than being there to support them and to raise funds for them and to enable them to do the things they should should be doing. So I think that often happens. I, I, I don't know that we, there are that many um, that really, you know, are, are put in, in, in running places that, that shouldn't be doing that. I, I, I think we basically, we get that right. But it's the people on the boards that sometimes need much closer examination. So was music everything you did or were there other kinds of things you, you've uh, you put on over the years? And I, I diversified uh, to an extent and, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, Barbican was a wonderful place to try out ideas. So I put on um, in the Christmas festival that I did um, uh, an afternoon with about cricket with Brian Johnson. And that was a huge success. And, and so we toured it all over the country. I remember we came to Leeds with it to the, the Grand Theatre. And uh, he'd have his panel of three buddy, buddies with him and they'd talk about cricket and there'd be questions and answers. And part of my responsibility as the producer, uh, promoter, was to provide for them everything. So, I mean, you know, they were sort of following me into restaurants and, and with the, uh, the hotel, of course, but, uh, you know, we booked the rooms, but they wanted the meals, everything. And uh, so it, but it was great fun. And I knew I was accepted by them when uh, Brian was talking to the great Jim Laker. We were all having lunch. And he suddenly turned to Jim and he said, well, Gubbers says we ought to do so-and-so. And I, I thought, I'm accepted now. I'm Gubbers. I'm on the same uh, way. They talk about me the same way as they talk about themselves. Uh, so that, that was enormous fun. And I had great admiration for Brian because he, uh, he'd been a war hero. He'd been in the Grenadier Guards. He'd won the Military Cross. And uh, he was a, a music hall artist, Monke, who would go and uh, talk to the audience before he brought his panel on and he'd start, you know, he'd say, I'm, I'm wearing my Raymond Gabay suit today for checks. 
and everybody would think that's very funny. And then he said, I, I, I made the mistake uh, of asking at the last thing I did uh, whether everybody could uh, hear me. And a voice piped up and said, I can, but I'll willingly swap with somebody who can't. And that was his kind of uh, uh, humor, which everybody enjoyed very much. And he made, he got people interested in cricket who didn't even know much about it um, because he made it so accessible and, 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 and so entertaining. Now, what about opera? Because you, um, you sort of put opera on in some quite unusual venues. Well, um, it's, uh, the, the, the big scale opera started um, with the, the Royal Opera when they were, they were going to close for um, uh, redevelopment and it never happened or did, it didn't happen until much later. But we went a long way down the path with them uh, with, uh, uh, and they suggested doing Turandot because the uh, Petunia's Turandot because the production they had they thought could be expanded for a, an arena stage and we got Wembley, um, uh, the the arena the the um, which had uh, in the configuration we used it had eight thousand seats and uh, we put it on there for ten performances. Uh, it was a tough sell, but in my goodness me, it was it was wonderful and we had some great uh, we had five different uh, Turandots and six Caliphs and so on because it had been cast rather late, so they were doing their best to get the people together. And uh, it was tremendous. Edward Downs conducted most of the performances and threw himself into it wholeheartedly. And I, I thought it's something that we could, we could actually build on, but they, uh, it was all that, I had some backers and it was all at our risk and it lost a lot of money. And I said to the Royal Opera, well, uh, you know, we should try to continue this, but you know, you, there has to be some sort of uh, share of the, the risk because otherwise they're very good at spending other people's money. Um, I thought if they had a financial interest in it, they might uh, uh, you know, t t try to cut a few unnecessary costs. Um, well, we never got anywhere with that. And what really disappointed me was in the annual report, the chairman uh, didn't even make any mention of uh, Wembley at uh, Turandot at Wembley, and that, that 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 was disappointing. But it gave me the taste for it. And very, not that long afterwards, um, I had the idea of doing opera in the round at the Royal Albert Hall, who were very enthusiastic. Um, they uh, supported me. They came in uh, with e equal risk. And uh, once we got over the initial couple of years, when we did Butterfly there in. Uh, in 1998 and flooded the arena with um, 65,000 litres of water and built a Japanese water garden. This was David, David, David Freeman and David Roger, his designer, who put all this together, very inspired. But it was a tremendous production and we revived it very many times. Uh, and out of that came Tosca and Aida and a lovely Carmen and uh, Francesca Zambello came to direct uh, La Boheme. And we also had ballet with uh, the Swan Lake, which Derek Dean uh, choreographed for English National Ballet. They, they, they um, were, were excited when they'd seen the original productions I was doing there. And so we collaborated on that. And that is actually still going. I mean, I'm no longer involved because I, I sold my old company a few years ago. And they, they lost the, uh, the, the ballet contact because, uh, you know, these things need nurturing and looking after and so on. But I was so proud when I was there, that uh, what, what we were doing, uh, you know, resonated and, and worked at a very high level. And it was enormous. It was an enormous pleasure. Uh, we also did Romeo and Juliet, uh, which was again Derek Dean. And the last time we re revived that, it was with uh, some of the performances were danced by Tamara Rojo and uh, Carlos Acosta. So a really uh, brilliant uh, casting uh, dancers and, and wonderful memories for me. I very, bring, bring back... Uh, a, a lot of excitement when I think about that. So we've got questions beginning to come in and just a mm -hmm. reminder to our audience, if you want to ask anything, put it in the Q&A and hopefully we will, uh, we will have time to put your question to Raymond. Um, Martin uh, Patterson, one of our audience, um, remembers seeing uh, Victor Borge at the Usher Hall in Edinburgh about 40 years ago. I, I don't yes. know if that might have been one, one of yours. Uh, but he's interested uh, if you've ever worked with Andre Ryu or, or James Last. No, I, I, I have not. Uh, both, of course, I know who both of them are. And uh, I suppose um, not a million miles away from what I was doing. But I never had the pleasure of uh, working with either of, them, either of them, I'm afraid. So if we look back over your career, um, what was the best thing that ever happened and, and what was the biggest disaster? 
Well, <clears throat> well, the best thing that ever happened was uh, almost always the last thing I did because it's always exciting, you know, that you, what you do, you're, you're proud of what you do. And so it's hard to, I mean, I mentioned Madame Butterfly, but I also mentioned all those other productions um, and, and, and they, um, as I say, they give me a lot of pleasure. Um, the Classical Spectacular, which is still going, so many people told me that they either it was the first concert that they'd ever been to or that they took their children there as the first concert they'd seen. Uh, disasters, yes, I mean, loads of them uh, trying to put on opera in the West End. I've got to put my hand up to that. Didn't work, got it wrong. Um, announced that we were pulling the season after the first two productions. Um, went to Paris where I had a flat at the time, turned my phone off, said, stayed there for the weekend, came back Monday morning, reconnected the phone. There were 150 missed calls, most of them from <laughs> newspaper people. But, you know, they say uh, today's newspapers are tomorrow's chips papers. So you just go on. I mean, you have to do that in this business. It's not a business to get... Uh, uh, I mean, uh, you, you, can, you get into everything, you get involved in everything, but you have to be able to know when to say no and when to stop and when to just move on. Uh, that I think is very important. Um, so yes, disasters, uh, lots and lots, and uh, you, you just carry on, you get on with it. Now we were speaking um, earlier about the, the seaside towns um, <laughs> Sort of in the uh, in in the post-war years, and and uh, I suppose how they've changed over the over the years. Um, these played a big part in 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 your story. Well, the the uh, seaside venues were were huge um, it, right up to uh, the seventies and possibly a bit beyond. But the the heyday was in those uh, few decades after the war. And it, it, I could get a lot of work there because they all wanted Sunday concerts and, and, and so on. And I traveled all over the country um, putting on uh, Sunday concerts. Um, I remember I put on uh, three at my own risk or my own partial risk because uh, in the early days, I tried to get fees and guarantees at the Palace Pier Theatre, Brighton. And uh, that was a, a tremendous experience. Uh, because uh, they, they gave me sharing terms, but I had to do all the press advertising, so I had to learn pretty quickly about that. And uh, the, the, I remember I used to go down on the Sunday and the lady who was the theatre manager would man the box office herself because uh, you know, the other staff had the, the day off and, and the money coming over the counter was largely mine because people booking on the Sunday were booked for the night itself. And I soon got used to the how to do this uh, when I was helping her, and people would say, how much are the tickets? And I'd say, this is all old money, 12 and sixpence, 10 shillings, five shillings. and they'd say, I beg your pardon, and I'd say, 12 and sixpence, 10 shillings, five shillings. <laughs> so they wouldn't hear the, the two lower prices, so inevitably they'd be too embarrassed to ask a third time and would buy at the top prices. So it was just a, a little trick of the trade that I learned. Um, but when, I remember the Gilman Sullivan evening there was, was extraordinary because uh, the place was pretty well full. And I made this, you know, what was then an enormous profit of £150. And I sat there afterwards thinking, how have I done this? And uh, it enabled me to go to America and, and, and start to de uh, develop contacts over there. One thing led to another. Uh, the, the seaside venues were, were great fun, and what was tremendous was the the, the esprit de corps. You know, you turn up, and um, the stage crew, the sta resident stage manager, would put up what they call the, the house drapes, the, the curtains and drapes to dress the stage. Uh, then they'd be all these moth-eaten curtains coming up. But by the time they put a bit of light on them and made the, they made, they really made it look something. And they were so proud. And at the end of it, when the audience were cheering and shouting and clapping, they, they took a personal pride in that. And I uh, developed these wonderful friendships with these guys, uh, you know, who were so kind to me because I was so young, um, uh, helping me and, 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 and getting me through things. Uh, that I remember with, uh, with enormous pleasure. Uh, you know, in the, you know t turning up uh, some seaside date, you know, having driven all day to get there, but uh, Landadno, you know, the, the motorways were not connected when we went to Landadno. So the M1 and the M6, you had about an hour and a half in the middle through Cannock Chase and goodness knows what, driving through, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, to get there, exhausted. But then you get there and you do the concert and there'd be this lovely glow because you would, 
you know, have a, a great house, people would have been entertained and there was a, a great, great feeling of satisfaction. And, and you were saying that a place like Blackpool might have several um, sort of high profile concerts running. Uh, yeah. through, well, through uh, uh, Blackpool would have, um, you know, resident seasons in the summer, maybe 10 headline artists in, in the different venues there it was incredible, the, the business. Um, to, to a lesser ex extent, the same thing in Scarborough and, um, and you know, the South Coast, uh, the East Coast. Um, it was a hu huge amount of business and, you know, big, big stars would be you know, in, in Blackpool. You get Morecambe and Wise and Tom Jones and I'm just, you know, pulling names out here. Other names like that in different shows at the, uh, you know, running at the same time. And if you like in competition, but there was enough business there uh, to, to, to keep them all going and keep them all happy. Now you uh, you say a question um, people often ask you is if you've worked with the three tenors, and none of our audience have asked you the question so far. So I'll ask you myself: Have you worked with the three tenors? I have worked with them individually, uh, not always singing. I worked with Carreras a lot with singing. Um, I mentioned Pavarotti, the masterclass, which um, he needed to do. Uh, it, this was in the early days of the Barbican because the tax rules at the time, in order to preserve his tax status over here, he needed to appear in the UK, but he couldn't sing because he was um, in between engagements. So we put this masterclass together where he um, had four singers and helped them. They were singing arias and so on, and he was making comments. And then the second half was uh, questions and answers. And somebody I remember said, you know, what, what, what went wrong with your film, Hey Giorgio? And he said, oh, it's not a very good. And uh, it, it was, you know, really genuine and nice. And afterwards, there was a reception up in the, one of the rooms in the Barbican. And Henry Wrong, the director, was really tough because he was, was absolutely sure that Pavarotti wouldn't turn up. And, the, you know, he was so pleased that he had. And the, we were all eating, you know, a buffet there. Uh, and Pavarotti stayed for an hour or so. And then he was going you know, with his uh, lady secretary, and the man came running up uh, to shake his hand because he could see he was going. And he had his dessert in the other hand, which was apple crumble and cream. So Pavarotti took his hand, but he couldn't resist with his other hand, dipping into the, uh, into the apple crumble and cream and, and taking a mouthful and licking his lips as he was, uh, licking, licking his fingers as he was leaving. He was a very uh, genuine, nice person. And uh, Placido Domingo came and conducted at the, the Philharmonia Orchestra at the Royal Festival Hall. Uh, for a, the, the ironic thing was that I, I was thinking all evening, you know, all these people would dearly love to see him facing them and singing, and all they've got is a, pardon me saying, so a picture of his backside as he's conducting, which wasn't quite the same thing, but they enjoyed it, and he did a nice concert, and he, he had a good time. Now, you mention um, some other well-known names uh, in your book. Um, Andrew Lloyd Webber, for example. Is he somebody you worked with uh, a lot? Well, I worked with him when he was married to Sarah Brightman, and uh, we, we did these um, concerts of the music of Andrew Lloyd Webber at the Barbican. Um, and then we went out on uh, a, a short tour with them. Uh, it was quite stressful because uh, he is... Uh, not the easiest of person, people to work with, but it was fun. It was nice. Uh, Michael Ball was singing. He wasn't known in those days. So it was a, you know, a very classy lineup. Um, and it was something that I enjoyed doing very much. And Andrew Lloyd Webber, uh, I, funnily enough, I mean, I worked a lot with his brother, Julian. So I knew their mother because she had come uh, in the early days of the Barbican. She always came to see Julian play, uh, whatever the cello concerto was, uh, often the old guy, but, you know, the Haydn and the... Uh, Borjak, perhaps, I can't remember. And um, so, you know, I had a, a bit of a connection there. And it was, you know, uh, it was a nice thing to do, uh, work with him. And he, somebody very, he's incredible, isn't he? Andrew Lloyd Webber, he never stopped. He's, uh, you know, producing one hit show after another. You also talk uh, in your book about uh, the Queen and also uh, the late Princess Diana. <clears throat> Well, uh, the, the Queen um, uh, I, I met uh, a few times um, uh, and I was able to take my, um, my aunt, uh, who was the last survivor of that generation, when I went to collect my CBE, uh, she came to the palace and she was so thrilled because it was the Queen who was um, uh, doing the uh, investiture 
And, and that was a really lovely occasion. And I, I, I felt that she represented my mum and my dad, who by then had, had died. Um, Diana was, uh, again, somebody I met on various occasions, particularly because she was uh, the patron of English National Ballet. So when we did Swan Lake, she came to the dress rehearsal, uh, before the dress rehearsal, and with the 65 swans, she posed for a photo, uh, which was for the Times, but which went around the world and guaranteed success. But when, when she had uh, done the photo, she said, could she stay for the dress, for the, to see the dress rehearsal? And of course we said, yes, absolutely. And she, uh, we said, where would you like to sit? And she sort of looked around and airily, she pointed to the Royal Box, and oh, I'll sit up in there. And so she went to the Royal Box and there was a terrible row the next day because by that time she was no longer um, a Royal Highness, I think you know, she'd separated or divorced from Charles. And the, the, the Royal Box is the Queen's property. Uh, so the hall got terribly earwigging the next day. Uh, I kind of think she knew exactly what she was doing. And she was hugely supportive. Uh, and she came to the gala of Swan Lake, I remember, not with Dodi Alfied, but with, uh, with his father, who was the chairman of Harrods at the time. And uh, was very complimentary about the ballet. And I think uh, you know, she died two or three months later. It was uh, just before she had a terrible tragedy. And I think her loss, yeah, I, it was felt by um, everybody, I think, that had known her and come across her. And for somebody like the English National Ballet, where she was such a support, I mean, she was a royal supporter patron of the sort that you never see otherwise. I mean, you know, people pay lip service to all this. It's fine, you know, you want that. But she actually made a difference. She put herself out to help them. And she knew the names of the dancers, uh, many of them, you know, when she was posing for that photograph. She could talk to them by name. And, and I found that, but I thought that was very impressive. Now, talk a little bit about selling the business and... Um... How did it feel to part company with something that, that you built up over so many decades? Well, you know, I get up every day nowadays and thank God that I don't have a ticket to sell after we've been through this terrible period, which we're not even through yet. Now, I had obviously no inkling of that when I sold the business. But, you know, I had a, a, a decent offer for the business. I wasn't getting any younger. Um, it was an opportunity to cash in. Um, I also think that, uh, and I, 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 I've thought about this a lot, that every dog has its day. You know, I was the young Turk when the barber could open, challenging, challenging the establishment and so on, trying out new ideas. But you know, decades on, I was you know, not as fresh and young as I was. And uh, it, it, maybe it was the time to pass the baton on to somebody else. And I had a very decent offer, which meant that uh, I and my family would be uh, very secure, uh, very comfortable. Um, I, I, I just thought it was a good thing, a good thing to do, and I don't regret it. Do I ever get, you know, tinges of uh, wouldn't I like to be? Yeah, occasionally, of course, because that was my life. But it it, it took over, and you know, it, it, it did for my marriage. It, it, it meant I didn't have much. Um, you know, spare time, you know, I was working when other people were at their leisure. Would I have changed it for anything else? No, I never would have done. But when I had the opportunity to take things a bit easier, um, I, I grabbed it. And um, I'm very glad that I did. And I think my family is too. We have a question from Abigail Kaplan. And um, if you do have a question, there really are only a few minutes left now. So do pop them in the Q&A. Uh, Abigail asks, what was the most humorous situation you experienced and who were you most impressed with uh, by as an artist and as a human being? I think that one of the most humorous uh, um, incidences was when I was doing a production of HMS Pinafore in the summer at the Queen Elizabeth Hall and we got Frank Thornton, Captain Peacock from Are You Being Served to do the the comic role, and he was good. He threw himself into rehearsals and so on. And we, we, everything was fine. We got to the first night and uh, made his entry with his ever-present sisters and his cousins and his aunts, and he sang his introduction. And then he had his big patter number, and he completely dried, but, I mean, completely. He didn't have a single word. So all you heard was the plinky, plinky, plonky of the orchestra and the chorus coming in on the refrain. He polished up the handle of the big front door, and 
the conductor shouting the words at him and Frank trying, you know, with his hands to indicate to the conductor, you know, was completely lost. And at the end of this, some of the audience were actually singing the, 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 the last verse. So I thought, well, I better, I better keep clear in the interval. I won't, I won't go near him in the interval. But at the end of the show, I thought, well, I can't not say something, you know, uh, thank him. So I went round to his dressing room and I knocked on the door and I said, oh, uh, and there he was with a big uh, glass of whiskey and his wife Beryl behind him with another big glass of whiskey. I said, Frank, I said, thank you very much. He said, had a bit of a memory loss. I don't think anybody noticed that. No. <laughs> And that's something that really does stick in my mind. I'm sure I can think of, you know, many other uh, incidences. I mean, who was the greatest artist is a very hard question because, uh, you know, there are so many wonderful artists. But I've already mentioned Yehudi Menuhin. And, uh, you know, he was somebody he was very, very special um, because uh, he, ha he had um, sides to him that you don't often see in artists. You know, you, you could appreciate. I remember that I actually presented him in his last London performance before he died, because we didn't know that at the time. And he was conducting, because he did a lot of conducting, then Beethoven's Ninth um, at the Albert Hall. And he, uh, it was a time of Kosovo, and we, had, we started with Beethoven's Eighth Symphony, and then he came off for the interval, um, and he said, I want to talk to the audience. And at the time, the Albert Hall only had their emergency microphone to evacuate the building. So that's all we could give him. And it sort of wheezed and cracked and God knows what. But he went out with this and he made a most um, impassioned uh, speech to the audience. They were absolutely spellbound about the, the, the Beethoven's Ninth, Ninth Symphony and its relevance to what was happening in Kosovo and putting the two together and explaining it. And it was a, a, a most beautiful thing to do. And then he conducted the... Uh, the symphony and I went round afterwards and he, he was coming back the following year to, to, for the anniversary of his first performance at the hall. I think it was the 70th anniversary of when he played the Elgar violin concerto with Elgar conducting. Um, and that was, you know, we got this lined up. And as I went to him in his room and he was on his own, just packing up his violin, no, no assistance or anything. And I said, Yehudi, thank you so much. And you know, looking forward so much to next year's celebration and uh, we embraced, and a few months later, I got this very, very sad news that he died. Uh, he was really special, and uh, yeah, if I had to pick out one person, I, I would, I pick him out. Yes, but I, as I say, there are many others that I could go through. Um, you know, uh, just I, I was privileged to work with many of them, and uh, they're all, you know, they they, they were friends. They were people I loved working with. And, you know, people said, oh, you must have got a lot of diva, divas people, you know, difficult to work with. And I said, you know what, if you respect people, you very quickly know the ones who don't want to talk to you, the ones who want to be left alone um, uh, after the rehearsal or just left alone, the ones, you know, whatever they want. And I, as long as you respect what they want, you'll get on fine. And I, that's what I always found. It was always, uh, in the end, it was always a pleasure. And they were the ones who were putting themselves out. I wasn't going out on the stage and, you know, doing something, uh, opening my mouth or, you know, playing the piano or whatever. They had to go out and perform and perform to a level that was commensurate with what they were known for. And that's a big challenge every time. So I, I respected them for that. And, and uh, I think that that's what, you know, why the relationships always worked well. So as someone who's been very successful in his field, um, is there a particular attribute you'd put this down to? And what advice would you give to someone who perhaps wants to follow in your footsteps? Well, um, what attributes? I mean, I think, you know, you've got a good cop, you know. I mean, this is what is my background. It's what I am. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, everything that uh, makes me from my mother's side was uh, uh, Ashkenazi. But her father actually was was Lutheran, so there's a mixture there. My dad's side was completely uh, Sephardic, and uh, you know, from uh, roots in the Middle East, but but uh, uh, you know, in, in what was then the, the, the Levant, and and then Aleppo, and so on. And then they they went briefly to India because they were merchants and so on. And I think all, all the way along the line, you know, you, you, there are attributes that I've got that are picked up from the family. Um, the question about um, you know, what encouragement, what would I say to somebody wanting to follow in my footsteps? 
Um, look, if you've got uh, determination and guts and want to do something, you can do it. I don't think anybody will be following exactly in my footsteps because the business has changed and the economics are different. And I don't think you could start on the very modest level that I did now sort of 55 years ago. Um, I think the, the audience expectations are different and so on. But if you want to get on in the business, then put go for it. Get, you know, just, I mean, I was, you know, J Jewish lads from Northwest London are not supposed to do anything. Well, they weren't in those days, you know, other than accountancy, the law, um, uh, uh, doctor, medicine, dentist, whatever, you know. Uh, so you, you, you have to break out of this and you have to... Um, uh, be determined and you know my parents were very supportive once they saw that I could make a go of it they were they were very supportive but they had a bit of a uh, you know uh, wobble in there before we got there but they were very delighted in the end and my mother who used to um, worry about me and hope I'd get a proper job uh, would then start to talk to people and say well do you know my son the impresario which is a word I never use because I think it's terribly pretentious but I was very delighted that she accepted where I was and was proud of it and that was very nice and yes if you're young go for it you know the world is your oyster and uh, you know it's challenging it's difficult but if you are determined you I'm sure you will succeed. I was going to ask you about this uh, this this title impresario, and I think uh, to an extent you've answered my part of my question, which is it's not a term you use yourself, but other people perhaps use use about you. But uh, what is it that makes an impresario? How is an impresario different from a, a promoter or a producer? There is no difference. It's just a different term. And uh, you know, I was regarding myself as a concert promoter. Um, uh, perhaps with the operas as a pr promoter and producer, but uh, impresario is not a, a, a word I would uh, voluntarily use. Um, uh, you know, it's just uh, I think it's it's probably better known in on the continent um, uh, rather, rather than here. But uh, you call me a promoter, I'm very happy. Somebody's asking who bought who bought the business from you. I sold it to a German company, uh, and they sold it on. It's now I think owned by Sony. I don't have any. Uh, connection anymore uh, and, and not for any other reason than that uh, you know once you've done something and you sold it you've got to move on you can't uh, you know the, the ties have, have gone and I wish them well and everything they do I the thing I I, I regret is that um, they the, the, a lot of my legacy went because uh, the opera ballet uh, the Christmas season at the um, uh, Albert Hall because the Albert Hall decided they you know could make the money themselves and they were much more entrepreneurial, but they've been kind enough to say to me that had I still been running the company, they wouldn't have done that. And I think it, it sort of underlines a point that um, uh, the, the, the kind of relationships that you have with people are very important uh, and, and maintaining those relationships so that you very quickly know if something's going wrong, you know, and you get in there before you get to the point where they say, we're not going to let you do this anymore. And, you know, for the Christmas festival and uh, uh, what I did, um, I, I always said, well, you know, it takes a good Jewish boy to give them what they need at Christmas because we can take a dispassionate view. And uh, it worked. Uh, it was a great time. And I think the Albert Hall in particular, uh, because it's like um, uh, it has a, a cathedral atmosphere without being re religious in any way. So you can go there and enjoy yourself. Uh, and, and not feel you're, 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 you're going into something else. And many years ago, I went to my then solicitor's ladies, uh, wife's ladies' luncheon club, Jewish club, in uh, Mill Hill. And uh, I'm talking to them. And I, I, I said it was, you know, before Christmas, sometime in November or something. And I said at the end, I've got some leaflets here on what we're doing. I said, some of these are, I hate to say this, Christmas concerts, carol concerts. I know you won't be interested in that. So, you know, please excuse me. And the lady in the front row, she said, well, she said, I love carol concerts. She said, I was going to, don't you love carol? And she's going around, the, well, yeah, we all, we all love carol concerts. So, you know, I said, oh, fine. Well, you know, <laughs> please come uh, and enjoy yourselves. Fantastic. Um, I'll finish with uh, uh, a question. Um, uh, this is quite a good one. Um, if you could only choose one ticket, which would you choose? Opera, ballet, classical, musical, uh, who, who would it be? I think it's almost impossible to answer that. And let me just tell you that when I did Desert Island Discs, I had to give my selection in 
um, three weeks beforehand. And every day thereafter, I wanted to change something. Oh, did I really want that? No, I don't know. You know, because I was hearing music all the time, putting programs together. I think music is music. And whether it's opera, ballet, operetta, um, uh, symphonic, um, uh, vocal, whatever it is, if you love it, you love it. That's, you know, how can, yeah, it's, 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 something, it's something we're blessed with. And where, where would we be if we didn't have all this wonderful music in whatever form it is? Life would be so much worse. So thank goodness we do have it. And uh, I'm so pleased and, and, and so privileged to have been a part of that for so long. And now I've written my book and... I've written it all down. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased. And yeah, it's up to the next generation and the generation after that to move on to see where the public mood takes them and, and whatever it is. But um, I, I hope I've, you know, passed the baton on in a way that uh, the people can move on with it. That's that that would be a great uh, great thing to know. And I think that's a great uh, place to uh, to pause our conversation. Raymond, thank you so much for being our guest this evening. It's been fascinating to speak to you and to hear uh, so many of your entertaining stories. Um, I can heartily recommend uh, Raymond's book. Uh, if you want to order a copy, there is a link on our website. Uh, and if you buy it through there, it'll earn Millim a few pennies, but it won't cost you any more. Uh, and to say thank you, Raymond, I'm going to send you a book of some of my photographs. This is David Adom, the Israeli Ambulance Service uh, saving lives uh, in Israel. I hope, hope you enjoy thank, thank, thank you very, very much. It, it's been a, a real pleasure to be here. I don't know who's out there, but bless you all for, for being here and allowing me to talk to you. I've, I've really enjoyed it, and thank you all very much indeed. Well, let me just share some details of our future programme before we go. Next Monday, the 18th of October, we have the long-time Millim supporter Vanessa Rosenthal as our guest. Uh, she'll be discussing her shortly to be published book, Inside Out, A Life in Stages. This is a memoir of her life as an actress and looking in particular at her sense of identity. This event will be live at the UHC Leeds and will be simultaneously streamed online. So uh, you can be there or stay at home. The choice is yours. Then on the 25th of October, Anne Seber will be speaking about her book on Esther Rosenberg. This is the first work about Esther Rosenberg and her husband, uh, to be published in some 40 years. Our monthly collaboration with the Jewish Historical Society of England is back on Monday the 1st of November with Dr Nicholas Evans. He's speaking about forgotten cultural Jews. And finally for now on the 8th of November we have Leah Garrett joining us from New York uh, to speak about her book X Troop, The Secret Jewish Commandos Who Helped Defeat the Nazis. All of our events are free but you can make a small donation on our website and that will help uh, support our work and the costs of providing these webinars. There is a link in the chat if you wish to click on it. We have speakers booked now into March of next year, so please do visit our website at millim.org.uk to sign up to our newsletter. Uh, this way you will make sure you don't miss anything. It remains for me to thank our speaker, Raymond Gabe, once again. Thank you so much, Raymond. Uh, Looking forward to seeing you all again at a future event. Until then.